just to say that we've been here for the last four days in this room. Um, the students I work with will know that I'm not the greatest fan of conferences. Uh, generally, there's too many of them. Uh, there's too much blah, 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 not enough ideas, not enough, enough uh, intellectual endeavor. But I have to say the last few days has been fantastic uh, in the contrast to that description I've just given you. There's been a real intellectual energy in the room. And I think that's really emanated from the fact that we've had uh, not only our keynote speakers, not only the chairs, but the panel members as well, as well, who've all come from different disciplines. I know all of them have been nervous before they've started their sessions about what they might have to say to each other because they all come from such different positions. And somehow in every single session, we've had really intellectually challenging discussions and very participatory as well. So it's been fantastic. And in that context, I think Professor Saskia Sasson is the uh, a wonderful speaker to uh, give us our last keynote, because she's absolutely in that tradition. Uh, she is the Robert Lew Esland Professor of Sociology and co-chair of the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University. And in addition to her appointments at Columbia, she serves on several editorial boards as an advisor to several international bodies. I feel it's slightly superfluous to say all this in the introduction, because of, of course her work is so well known. But um, I think the point to really stress is she is a public intellectual. We've had a lot of discussion in the last few days about who's an academic, who's an activist. Uh, of course, all these things should collapse, and we should always remember that uh, intellectual thought is inherently political. And I think Professor Sasson's work is an exemplary, a wonderful example of that. Uh, she's written in many newspapers. If you go onto the website and search her name, she's very generous in the amount of interviews she gives and her radio appearances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, to um, uh, talk about her position. And I think some, one of the ways we can sum up what she does in her work is always trying to find a new language. It's something we've been talking about in the last session, uh, but it is not just for the sake of inventing new categories, as we were talking about just uh, earlier today, but it's uh, talking about ways in which to describe the world as it changes around us. And I think one of the words she uses, I think, which describes this very well, is the idea of deciphering. Um, so she's a very prolific urban sociologist. Of course, she wrote the very famous book, The Global City. And it is really, um, I think, in her work on globalization, which is not an analysis which much work on globalization actually does, which is about erasure, which is about standardization. But instead, it is to look at the sort of very visceral and real ways that the global uh, uh, emerges in certain contexts. And of course, the major context that she talks about is the city. The city as a site of possibility, where new cultures, new political subjectivities, new forms of community can emerge. And, and, through, and through talking about that, uh, Professor Sasson, of course, talks about the migrant and migrant culture in particular. So she sees the global city as a border zone, really, where old spatialities and temporalities merge with a new sort of global digital age to uh, bring about these new subjectivities. But um, she's also going to be talking today about something else, which is happening at the same time. And um, you mentioned the idea of catastrophe sometime in your work. And I think uh, you know, the idea of the catastrophic is something that has spawned the history of the 20th century. And I think what we see in the 21st century is not necessarily something radically new, but old tendencies which have been there, which emerge in new ways. So in her talk today, which is based on her book, Expulsions, uh, Professor Sasson will be looking at what's happening uh, also in the spaces of the city and the new threat that's emerging, if you like, under the neoliberal order, which is where we see um, growing uh, cases of inequality, um, violence, structural violence, uh, and increasingly a culture which is being uh, dictated by corporate capitalism. Yeah? And she especially she talks about sort of investment in property, which is a form of saving. So investment now is no longer about building infrastructure, which is to the benefit of all citizens, but it's something which is exclusionary. Yeah? So she's using the term expulsions in its widest possible sense. Um, so it is talking about uh, the margin, making visible the complexities and the extremities of what's happening under the system at the moment and how that's impacting on ideas of sort of global citizenship. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Sasson, and please join me in giving her a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. I really want to thank all of you for being here, but very especially Professor Parvathi Raman, if I got that right, and Carrie Benjamin, whom I drove almost crazy, I believe. You're 
camouflaging it rather nicely. <laughs> But uh, it really, it, it gives me much pleasure. I understand that you come from several different places. And uh, I love talking to students, graduate students, also undergraduates. So it's a great pleasure. Um, let me throw myself promptly into the subject. And I, I, I should say that I was asked to talk about my new book. I, had, I did bring a second set of slides. Slides would deal with the question of immigration and membership. Um, but we, the little committee, decided I should focus on my new book. My new book focuses on a range of issues that move away a bit of what you're focused on, I think. But, uh, but it is part of the ground level condition that in a way is also <coughs> generating some of the particular processes on migrations, diasporas, etc., that you have focused on. So think of it that way. Oh, I realize I don't have a, how do I move my, okay, fine, fine, got it. Um, now, the focus, um, the focus on in, in, in this book called Expulsions is on something that I call the systemic edge. <coughs> the systemic edge is not the border. The systemic edge has nothing to do with interstate borders. In fact, I argue that in many of our countries, the operational space of the economy, society as an, as an incorporated entity, et cetera, et cetera, is beginning to shrink. And so that act actually the systemic edge means that there is terrain that fits within the nation state that is not really operational. It is there. There are people on there. There are activities on there, but it's not part of the core, if you want. And, and so I use the term of economic cleansing, you know, our measures, etc. It's like they evict all kinds of conditions. So there is a kind of a space that in its full materiality is invisible, really a set of spaces. Now, for me, this one way of describing the systemic edge is the point where a familiar condition, a familiar process, becomes so extreme that it actually, we lose it, conceptually, statistically, etc. In short, we lose it in terms of the existing categories for gathering data, recognizing what is data, for interpreting data, for analyses. So it is uh, mostly very material. So it's not a question of what these eyes can see. It's a question of what the theoretical eye sees, the statistical eye, the conceptual eye. So that is a bit the argument. Now, partly this book, this is one of my little books. I big, big books each takes me 10 years. It, I don't know what it is for you, but I, I'm the, I like to say when I go around, you know, I, have, I am of a certain age. I've spent, I feel I've been in the academy for 120 years. I exaggerate clearly, but you know, like 25 years. And I really like going around and saying, I'm the author. In my 30, I exaggerate a bit, in my 30 years of research, I'm the author of three books, which is not true. But the big books, which are the ones that really count, you know, for me, each one has taken me 10 years. Isn't that astounding when you think about it? Only the academy allows you to sort of use them. I mean, probably an enormous amount of wasted time in there, you know, where your mind sort of drivels. But I do think that that temporal immersion that you live with for so long, and it often cuts across, if you want, many historical, not many, huh, but many, many <laughs> historical moments, actually, you know, means something. But anyhow, in this particular little book, I address sort of, if you want, um, the explanations, the master explanations that we have for our current period, which in a way are crises and inequality, I would say. You know, this is sort of the other terms of the moment, certainly. And I argue, you know, crises is actually a feature of capitalism. Capitalism would shrivel without crises. Capitalism is profoundly destructive. It needs to invade other sectors. And when you take the mother of all the state of, uh, forms of power in capitalism, finance, finance is basically highly destructive. 
and continuously in crisis. So crisis is not enough to mark, to capture whatever is particular, specific, a bit different about this current period we're in, which probably has been going on for 10 years. In my reading, it begins to constitute itself almost 30 years ago in the late 1980s. And then it begins to spread to other parts of the world. The other category, inequality, very important. I've been writing about that long before it became fashionable. I remember being much criticized when I, in the late 80s, was saying we're moving towards a profound transformation in terms of job distributions and income distributions. And we were going to growing inequality, etc. And by then, at that time, it was not acceptable. But ultimately, inequality is a distribution. And a distribution is not an explanation. The explanatory power of a distribution lies in that distribution. But it does not necessarily explain the distribution itself. So I came up with this term expulsions, which I really distinguish from notions of, um, of social exclusion, which is its own powerful, well-established category I'm not uh, playing with that at all. I argue that expulsions is precisely that moment at the systemic edge. It is a conceptual expelling, a physical expelling, an expelling that takes on many particular forms. There are whole anthropologies that one could build around that systemic edge or that the, the diversity of systemic edges. Uh, so I, in the book, actually the chapter that really got me going a lot which has nothing to do with your subject. <laughs> but I put all my cards on the table here. Um, uh, is a chapter that I call Dead Land, Dead Water. And it's partly but little engagement with the category climate change. Climate change sounds so beautiful. And I say we need to name it. Dead land, dead water. I say we should show in kindergarten maps of each of our countries with that which is dead land. We have a lot of it, by the way. Um, in the United States, especially, vast amounts of dead land. And sort of say, you know, mommy and daddy did that. You know, we have to begin to... Uh, so that is sort of the, the mindset, you know, of this little book. Um, now... To do the kind of research that I do, and really I expose, eh, expose, I emphasize, I've been doing this for a very long time, but now I have given it a kind of a shape. And so I have been giving a talk, the whole talk, uh, a talk where the whole talk is what I call before method. I sort of, I am one of those who does not think that you can simply throw out the dominant categories of an epoch though I have long contested and engaged the dominant categories of an epoch. The Global City was one of those, the book that you mentioned. Uh, I don't think we can just simply throw them out of the window. But we can engage them. We can interrogate them, interpolate them. Um, and so one, one of the, the, the zones that I have... Uh, that I have understood really matters to me in the kind of research which is oriented also towards discovering and naming, making visible, uh, that, that marks my own research, is really this notion of the fuzzy edges of paradigmatic knowledge. I think paradigmatic knowledge has a strong core. <clears throat> That's why it's paradigmatic. It comes out of extraordinary intellectual fights and combats, you know, it's got to be taken seriously. It's a collective product in many ways. Um, but I also think that at times of deep transformations, and by deep transformation, I do not mean something that changes completely. I mean deep, and that can be partial. The, the core of the paradigm becomes a weak source for explaining. And so at that point, I think that the fuzzy edges and especially, I do a lot of stuff between, because I, I have a degree in, in my PhD is in economics and sociology, two very different disciplines, actually. So I'm really interested in fuzzy edges where the fuzziness allows you to mix forms of knowledge, to mix paradigmatic forms of knowledge, but precisely in that fuzzy, weak edge. The zone before method, in other words, 
is a zone of freedom. I'm playing off the famous book after method. I don't know if people know that book, but I really care about the before method. Before I re-enter the disciplining of method, which as a social scientist, sooner or later you have to enter, I want that space where I can explore, position myself vis-a-vis -vis the object of study the way I want. Totally anarchic, totally arbitrary, in terms of the existing paradigm. Some, you know, some of it might coincide, but much of it does not. So in that sense, truly a zone before method. Um, now, one of the ways in which I then, then deal with that, to give it a bit of a shape, is the notion of a tactical analytics, literally tactical. In other words, that positioning vis-a-vis -vis the object of study. Um, and so here are some of these analytic tactics, very simply put. One is the need to actively destabilize stabilized meanings. No complex meaning is stable forever. But certain meanings really acquire a stability. If you look at the post-war period in Europe and in North America and parts of South America, the Keynesian decades, there was a kind of stability when you said, what is the state? What is the economy? What is the middle class? Those meanings today, I argue, are profoundly unstable. I've done a lot of this research in what I think is my best book, Territory Authority Rights, which is one of those that took me 10 years. But anyhow, there I really went into depth into this. You know, the question there for me was how do complex cha uh, uh, systems change? And they don't change by changing everything. They change by repositioning critical elements. So out of that comes also this notion of a destabilized meaning. We still can use the economy. We can still use immigration, but they're unstable meanings. I will get to this question of immigration also a bit later. And then secondly, in the shadows of powerful um, explanations. You know, what don't I see when I invoke a powerful explanation? What don't I see when I say immigrant? Well, I don't see, for instance, that by far, most immigrants are citizens. There are about 10 million people without a nationality. You probably all know that, right? But there are 350 million immigrants. They're all citizens. What happens to the debate on immigration if we begin to say, you know what? We're all citizens. And then the question becomes, who are we, the citizens, if we're so easily degraded and if we're so easily seen as sort of illegal humans? because that is basically, you know, how very often they get treated. Anyhow, now what I'm obsessing right now, which comes partly out of my territory book, but it's, is, is uh, the category territory. And it comes back to my systemic edges, the difference with interstate borders. I think that we need to work analytically with a category territory in a way that allows it to take on more meaning than the meaning that has dominated that category for the last hundred years, which is national sovereign territory. When a complex term has only one meaning, no matter how complex, it is not working analytically. So I want to make territory work analytically. And to give you sort of one example of what I mean at the extreme, I argue that dead land, is a kind of territory. I mean, I just want to make dead land work analytically. I should say, just quick footnote, by territory I mean a complex category. Territory is not land, it's not terrain, it's not ground, it's not space, it's not earth. It is only partly material. A kind of materiality that has embedded logics of power, which in our Western modernity takes on its most developed form in the modern state, and embedded logics of claim making, which at its best in our Western modernity again is citizenship. So, and I argue, for instance, in the work that I've done on high finance, that high finance makes territory. The black pools in finance, which account for about 70% of financial trading, they fall outside any regulatory framework. And this, the data that we have on that comes from the Central Bank of the United States, from the Fed. This is not me, the lefty, making it up. The chair, the head of the, of the American Central Bank, 
said about 70% of financial trading is happening in black pools and we do not know what happens in them. I argue for finance to, be, to do that, it has made a territory. Clearly it's a territory that is in very good part digital, but in some part it is not because it needs vast computers to do all of this. So there is always this materiality and so I want to capture in that case a territory which albeit is mostly digital is also material. And then the making of it all. I'm sort of, uh, in this little book, one of my filières, you know, a sort of flashlight to navigate very complex, multifaceted domains, I bring it down to a very simple proposition, which is partial. Powerful, but partial. And I don't want to be burdened by inherited genealogies of meaning, confining cultures of you know, of how we interpret, etc. No. So it is a bit brutal. Uh, so I say we make, I actually love that, I love we make. Uh, we make this. <laughs> yeah, right, now you begin to understand where I'm getting. So internally displaced people, right? They keep growing, keep growing. We made that. That is not simply a function of a function of a function. I argue we made it. Again, this is a partial approach. But the purpose is to, to alert, to wake up, to et cetera, et cetera. Um, we make this. And this, when you look at it, this is an achievement. I'm using achievement ironically. We managed in 20 years to eliminate. The we is clearly uh, an ambiguous we, uh, a rhetoricized we. Whatever. It doesn't matter. It's some of us somewhere, with power, without power, whatever. So 20 years, billions and billions of cubic meters of water gone. One of the biggest seas reduced to that little dark tranche that you see. You see what I'm talking about, right? The third picture. Uh, we made this. We managed to melt down. And the permafrost is melting too, <coughs> producing a methane. We haven't experienced that yet. It's still not totally coming out, which is a methane gas that we have never experienced. It's so, that's how strong it is. So I say, these are capabilities. Clearly, I'm not using it in the Amartya sense, positive sense. And I frankly, in my work, I use capability and I say, we cannot say that it's inherently positive. What is positive time one, at time B, it might not be so positive, right? We experience that continuously over time, over history. So I, I just want to emphasize capabilities as something that, you know, the making part, etc., and that it is a variable. <clears throat> now, to sort, of, to sort of bring together the many different things that I want to bring together under one umbrella in this type of analysis, uh, I need an, an ordering, something that orders. So one rhetorical question one might ask is, what is the steam engine of our epoch? That capability, both good and bad, which was present far beyond its own narrow operational space, which has left big traces, genealogies of meaning and of making that we cannot easily get rid of, that kind of power. Now, usually, and I hope that you're all thinking, well, what, what would you think is a steam engine of our epoch? Usually people think information technology, and I think that is a good answer. But at this point, I would argue, partly as a provocation, partly for the sake of debate, eh, that information technologies have become infrastructure. An infrastructure, quick definition, necessary but indeterminate. How we use it can vary enormously. That's an, like train tracks can be used to carry bombs or to carry food for hungry people. You know, a kind of necessary but indeterminate. And by the way, footnote, I'm very interested in indeterminacy. I think we have tended to really overlook indeterminacy in our research as social scientists, etc. Uh, maybe other disciplines have not failed that way. But um, so anyhow, so one way then <coughs> of defining 
what, I, what kind of a steam engine you know, I'm talking about, is that which can make a new ordering. It doesn't mean changing everything, but it means that some very powerful thing, and, or what is in and what is out. So I argue that while information technology is a good element to bring up as, you know, the steam engine of our epoch, at the same time, I think there is something that is, has been far more powerful, though dependent on, and in that, digi the digital, and in that sense, the digital is infrastructural, uh, and that is high finance. Now, you can see that, are you sure you wanted me to talk about this? Uh, <laughs> we're going deep now into, but never ask a financier to explain high finance to you. Is anybody here a financier? No, I often have a lot of financiers sitting in the audience and if they're not super powerful, they like what I say. If they are the elite financiers, they don't like it at all. Um, now, so, so finance is different from traditional banking. The traditional bank sells money it has. Finance, and this is the trick, sells something it does not have. And in that selling what it does not have lies both its creativity, it's got to invent bridges into something, and its danger, because it has to invade. And so it has been doing this for 20 years. It's only in the last 10 years that it has started to invade the fragile, the vulnerable, the, the, the entities with limited resources, and then it begins to hit back in a very visible way. We begin to actually, if you're modest, you're poor, you are poor maybe not, but modest, uh, little firms, you begin to feel the impact, you feel the aggression. But it has been going on, in my reading, the way I look at these materials, since really the 1980s with Wall Street, zero, ground zero, um, uh, London, the, the partner, but the weaker partner, now London is totally dominant. And then it's of course sort of spreads to all these, you know, we have about 100 global cities now, which are really strategic terrain, both for the powerless, I argue, and for, especially for the powerful. Now, so finance as capability is a danger, and that is, I argue, the steam engine. Now I want to show you just a few things. So one is, and I wish I had a pointer, but I don't, look at the, look at the growth curve of this. Now, 206, uh, 201 to 207, that is a very sharp growth rate. And in, in the numbers that are attached here is less than a trillion uh, up to 62 trillion. Think of anything that you are familiar with or know about that has that growth curve. Now, just to situate, those 62 trillion are more than global GDP of all the countries in the world, including China at that time, which was more like 54 trillion. Secondly, those 62 trillion is only 10% of, of global finance, as measured by outstanding derivatives, which is a classic measure, which was 630 trillion. Now, I, when I do these data, I go digging and digging. I say, what means it? What does it mean? Because finance is not about money, so this is an indicator of the money part. Now, um, so I, I, then I ask, for instance, what's the actual currency in circulation at that time? In other words, currency not as in Bitcoin, but currency as in officially uh, produced uh, currency by the central banks of all the countries in the world, which at that point was about 230 trillion. So you know what we name as a, as a monetary measure, you know, it's something else. And so one way of putting it simply is a capability. Now I want to, I want to show you now a couple of conditions that indicate that this extreme form of power actually moves into very modest settings. But it's not visible as such, you know, it's a kind of invisible. So, so here, just very quickly, well, I'm going to skip this. So when modest neighborhoods, I don't want to develop this too much, but the point here was as finance is invading more and more sectors, at some point it's running out of high value assets, 
something that is, you know, has a kind of reality attached to it. It's reduced, this is the United States, which is ground zero for all of this, um, to very modest houses and asset. The high level circuit of capital, of investors, say, please give me an instrument that is not simply something based on a derivative, based on an interest rate, blah, 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 something that has real stuff in it. Well, the only thing more or less left in the United States was some very modest houses, very modest. The purpose of this instrument was not to enable people to have a house, not at all. The purpose was to generate an asset-backed security for the high finance circuit. To do that, they had to camouflage, hide the low value of those modest assets. Tricky, huh? Very tricky, actually, to do that because it's representing an asset. And, but what they do in, they trot in very high-grade debt. But they can sell it as high, you know, uh, uh, as an as asset-backed security. Now, this process meant, at, at its high point, very short, brutal history. It's now declared illegal, the instrument, truly abusive. At its high point, it meant that if you were one of those agents that was trying to get people to sign, all you wanted was, sign, sign. These were people who never thought they could own a house. And so, sign, sign, you're fine, you're fine. You don't have to pay anything for five years. All they wanted was the signature on the contract. You had to get, if you were one of those agents, 500 of those contracts signed in a week to make it work. According to the United States Central Bank, 15 million such contracts were signed. Let's remember, a household can be one person, two people, three people, etc. Now, here's the brutal result. They got all they needed out of it, eh? more or less. Many of the agents went broke because eventually it doesn't work anymore. So here you have numbers every year, 1.2 million foreclosure. Now, foreclosure is not an, an eviction, but most of these, according to the central bank, 14 million households have... Somebody doesn't like what I'm saying. By the end of uh, 14, we're out of their homes. So you have these, and then it goes on the first half of 2014, and so now sort of it's dribbling to nothing. Now, I'd like to make 14 million households a bit Pythagorean as a number. 14 million is very hard for the mind to understand what that is. So I'm Dutch. My country has 16 million inhabitants. It's like a voice from upstairs says, OK, everybody on the Dutch territory, out. Where you go, I don't know, but out. And now we're going to repeat the exercise. That is 14 million households, in other words, about 30 million people. That is an extraordinary amount of materiality. And it is invisible. Because they're lost. They're people, I mean, some of them double up. Some of them, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of people living in tent cities in the United States, the same tents as the international refugee system. They double up. They go homeless. The biggest homeless encampment in the United States after 2008 is in Silicon Valley. And I have video. And if you're standing on top, Silicon Valley is a valley, so it has hills and it has. The mansions are on top. Google Castle is on top. Google Castle is hypermodern, but you know what I'm talking about. And if you're standing up on the hill, that hill where that encampment is, you don't see it. All you see are the trees. And so you come from the bottom of the hill, and then you see it. And it was mostly young people. They were techies to a very large extent. Maybe not all of them, but many. And they had indicators. They had, um, they, I didn't mean they had indicators, I mean they had, in quotation marks, and this is an indicator, um, the most expensive sneakers I had ever seen, and the most extraordinary bikes. Because in LA you need transport, you need wheels. And so of course you go homeless, you, they probably signed some of these contracts, you know, and they couldn't pay, suddenly there was nothing. They were fired, you know, mixtures of things. So a lot of the people who lost ground were sort of modest middle class and some who were on their way to be a bit less modest. Um, now, Europe thinks it doesn't have this problem. This instrument is a brilliant instrument. And I don't say it ironically. It's a lethal instrument. It kills, basically. But it is brilliant. 
And um, so it spreads. It's illegal in the United States, but not in Europe. It is moving into Europe and wait till it hits India with its growing middle classes and China with its expanding middle classes. So here, I'm so, well, here is a graph that shows you the high point. It was a very short, brutal history huh? that is sort of dribbling to an end. This is Europe. Now look, I like, I wish I had this pointer, but look, look, among the highest foreclosure rates, now foreclosure is an eviction notice, but we know de facto that many of these foreclosures become evictions. Germany is among the highest. Germany who does everything so well. I don't mean to, to I don't mean to attack any German, but I'm just attacking Schäuble, Mr. Schäuble. I have a thing with Mr. Schäuble. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so Germany, is, and that is every year, this is not cumulative. You know, the numbers are significantly smaller, but these are households. Now Hungary is the worst off in terms just of actual numbers, which is a million households are out of their home. Hungary is a very small country. The other biggie is Latvia, almost 400,000. In other words, the massive destruction of an emergent middle class. I mean, this is unbelievable. And then among the lowest ones are nice countries, Denmark, the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a bit less nice nowadays. I don't know if you know, all the social benefits have been cut a bit, just a bit, but cut. Uh, it doesn't look good. Um, now, the outcome, and now I'm going to switch gears. The outcome here can be read. There are many interpretations. But one interpretation, what you wind up with, is a lot of empty urban land. Because these are urban. This is not out in some rural whatever or a little gated community on top of a hill. No, this is urban. And I want to show you another mutation of urban land. So I'm going to take you now in a direction which is a bit more concrete. Rather than looking at businesses and at financial markets, I want to, to take you into something that is a bit more concrete. And that sort of tells a tale rather quickly, as opposed to having to talk endlessly to extract a tale you know, from data. Now, this is what's happening here. So this is total national and foreign investment in cities. This excludes site development, as they call it. Now, let me give you an example. And this is yearly, by the way. So it's not a small amount, year after year. It really takes off after 2008, after the crisis. And um, so let me give you an example of what is excluded in the case of New York. A very large Chinese corporation, construction company, bought a huge piece of land in New York City called Atlantic Yards. I don't know if people have, it's huge. And it now is, it's sort of a degraded or em partly emptied logistical site, site for warehousing. So it's thinned out a bit. It used to have a bit of kind of industrial base too. And so now you have artists, little shops, little crafts work operations, and then you still have the old sort of warehouse functions and some industrial. Well, this Chinese company has some other ideas for it. So all of that is going to go out and going to be replaced with 14 huge luxury what else? Apartment towers. Now here's an interesting urban moment. In other words, they're going to raise the density very, very much. And for many people, the way they are measuring urbanization is density. If it's dense, it's got to be a city. I truly contest that. So I want to recover, and this is like a little footnote, but it weaves itself into the narrative a bit. Um, so I want to recover a notion of city, where the city really, density is not enough to mark city or cityness. That the city, in one way, so what I do, back to my analytic tactics, I need to remove myself, I need to destabilize the meaning of urbanization, right? Enough, enough that I'm so far away from it conceptually that I have to rediscover, well, what the hell is a city, right? That's, that's, that I do that with things that are a little, little, little self little less self-evident. So I argue a city is actually a complex but incomplete system. And in that mixture of complexity and incompleteness lies its capacity to outlive other complex systems that are close. Think all major corporations in the world, also older forms of corporations, finished. They have not lived a full life. The last 20 years we have seen the loss of 
hundreds of thousands of ferns. But cities have outlived many different historical periods. Think of forms of organized power finished, you know, across the centuries. So in that sense, the city is a very special space. Now, just to nail down one aspect of its specialness that I happen to care about, the city is a space, I argue, where those without power get to make an economy, a culture, a history. Think immigrant communities. You know, the immigrants arrive with modest means, they'll transform a neighborhood. A degraded neighborhood becomes a thriving immigrant economy, immigrant with lots of cultural things attached to it. <coughs> that is something that the city enables. So the city, and so the global city, for instance, for me is a space. Number one is the, the frontier. I argue, this is, again, a footnote. I argue that today's frontier is not that the edges of empires, like it was you know, in the 1800s, in the 1700s. Today's frontier is in the center of our big cities, where extreme forms of power and extreme forms of powerlessness actually have an encounter. I define the frontier as a space where actors from different worlds have an encounter for which there are no established rules. Right? That is sort of my sort of uh, a bit conceptualized way of defining the frontier. So the frontier in the United States, your frontier goes, I don't know to when here in the UK. You know, I really that's a story that I history that I don't understand very well. But in the United States, clearly when the when the Europeans come, they the front the whole of the United States eventually becomes a frontier zone, right? It becomes conquered, destroyed. The frontier is a very violent the British Empire in Africa, etc. You know, many examples. We we don't like examples. And I argue that today, that that notion, if you think Britain wanted to own or access the whole of Africa, control. Spain wanted to control the whole of Latin America. Today, that is not. When China buys land, oh, I'm, I'm, there are 15 governments, I don't want to s single out China. When they buy land to grow, you know, your urban land grabs in the global south, the aim is not to control the whole of those countries. The aim is to use what you need and get out of there. So I see many, and the same thing here. So this kind of investment basically transforms urban tissue into mega projects. A mega project eliminates, dilutes urban tissue, little streets, little squares, little this, little that, little office of the government, you know, a public office where people go, and it transforms everything into a mega project, which is private, with guards guarding it. So back to the city as a space where those without power get to make a history. Those without power do not get to make a history in an office park. You know what I mean by office park, right? A private corporate thing, it's controlled. They need the low wage workers, but those low wage workers are out there at night. It's a controlled space you do not become a maker of a history in that. So in that sense, for me, this issue of this type of buying, and this is every year, you understand, is very problematic. Now, I, I wanted to mention something that many of you who, if you have spent time in London, know. Um, so some people say, well, well, this is gentrification. It's that too. The question is, if the deep, process can be fully explained with the language of gentrification. And I say no. And so the good example is the royal Qataris. You know what I'm talking about? They now own more of London than the Queen of England. Mind you, the Queen of England is not the main owner <coughs> of London. But you know, it's a good, nice juxtaposition. <coughs> and the Qataris now will own Canary, Canary Wharf, right? So. To simply say gentrification, gentrification is at some level a correct description. The street level, the people, I think a deeper dynamic. And that is why I talked about first about empty urban land, now about this 
a mutation of urban land. Um, before I, I just want to quickly show you. So the dribble, I have, I'm working with a data set of 100. The 100 cities that are the main destinations for foreign investment that basically is either buying buildings because it really wants to buy urban land, so it's not about the buildings, or is storing its capital because there's a lot of money at the top that doesn't know where to go now. They have, uh, you know, just have done the last thing and now they don't know what to do with it. So the last frontier, so to speak, is urban land, safe investment and rural land. Huh? I'll, I'll get to that too. So here you have sort of this, the top cities and then it dribbles, dribbles. It's amazing the hundred cities, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, you know, you have a whole bunch of cities, but then uh, cities in, in several different parts of the world. And if you only take <coughs> foreign investment, London is number one. I, by the way, I think that whether it's foreign or national does not matter that much. I think the issue, it's corporate. So the minimum, I forgot to add, the minimum investment as using indicator for New York <coughs> is, is uh, investments that are at least $5 million. This is not you buy a little apartment because you like London and you want to come to the opera regularly. No, it has nothing to do with that. You know, that's happening too and that's fine. And again, I want to emphasize whether it's foreign or like the Kazakhstanis, for instance, wow, they have discovered New York. The Chinese and the Kazakhstani are the latest massive buyers in New York. You know, I, I don't, somehow I don't mind, you know, whether it's this nationality question, that doesn't matter. But it's sort of the, the implication really, this privatizing of urban land, you know, where are we going with this? <coughs> now, so one, one question that, um, that I ask after many, many more such examples, you know, which are these little micro innovations, if you want, in how we organize our economies, how we organize public, what was once public space, etc., etc. So I sort of ask, are we really dealing with the new systemics? And here I wanted to bring in this slide rather than everything that can be said about it, because I want to sort of use the case of Greece for a minute as an example. So when you hear the IMF, the European Central Bank, and Mr. Schäuble speak about Greece, it's like Greece is this terrible, terrible, bad, 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 bad child in the European Union, and we are all so very, no, we're not. So this is the slide that I have in my book where I show that all of these countries experience, I love these single lines, you know, they, they are rather complex contents, but anyhow, and so you see that also Germany, there was a systemic crisis, we are living with a systemic crisis, Germany goes up, you know why, unlike the others which sort of bubble, you know, not, not so brilliantly, Germany, does anybody know why Germany? Not because they are German, huh? <laughs> that would not be the answer, Germany, because Germany has the leading intermediate manufacturing sector in the world. Machines that make machines. Machines that make machines are the key machines. You understand? <laughs> the whole world needs them. There are very few countries which have, and the United States in a particular area in the Chicago, in the Midwest also has these very, very, I mean, it's just a level of manufacturing it has nothing to do with making an ice box or whatever, or, or one of these laptops. And that is a sector, as all manufacturing tends to be, that is very distributed. You have a huge middle sector there of very well-trained um, uh, workers and very well-trained designers for that stuff and very well-trained whatever, you know. And so that creates a sort of a possibility, but the German economy, as I showed before, is also suffering. But the main point I'm trying to make is that we are witnessing a new systemic, you know, a systemic turn, if you want. Now, I wanted to show you a few things that capture this whole talk about inequality, et cetera, right? I like to nail it down with some concrete. So look at this, corporate, and here I want to point out a particular trend, corporate profits after tax, United States exhibit number one. Don't think that that straight line means nothing was happening, no, but it was below billions, huh? so it goes up, so in the 1980s, you can see it goes up, nice, 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 then it has a crisis that I say, oh, say lasted two hours. It lasted two years, okay? And then it goes up more than before the crisis because the, the, the trend continues up, up, up. Now, on the one hand, all these miseries, all these expulsions, 
And on the other hand, a capacity to capture what there is to capture that becomes more accentuated after the crisis. The crisis served to create a crisis in the mind of the state, in the mind of elites, that then enabled this corporate <coughs> sector to do better than ever. I have a lot of stuff on the financial, but this is not the, the, the moment to talk about that. And if you look at corporate assets, the crisis lasted about 30, about half an hour. You see that? I mean, you barely notice it. So this tell, and, and it goes up higher, higher after the, the crisis really materializes very strongly, you know, in 208. That's where that little wrinkle sort of 27, 208, 29, and then. And of course, most other sectors are still, you know, they have really got a hit. And then in that sense, Greece is the extreme case for issues that have to do with their oligarchs, you know, as the FT put it, and Madame Merkel. Not so often are FT and Madame Merkel actually speaking the same language, but there they use that word. And our states are all getting a bit poorer, including the German state. So in the United States, probably the extreme case, we have 15,000 bridges that we know are going to fall but there is no money to fix them. When a bridge falls, it's, a bit, it's not like they have closed those bridges. Those bridges are still using those bridges. So, you know, these are, and every year there are a few bridges that fall and then there are a few dead people, a few destroyed cars, a few destroyed livelihoods, you know, no matter. That is a very odd position for a state to maintain. So I think our states are a bit out to lunch. They have been overwhelmed, you know, out being out to lunch is a certain expression. <laughs> it means not that you're literally out lunching too long. It means that you don't really know what you're doing. Um, they, it's, it's like they have lost the plot. How can? Now, the United States, for me, is a bit exhibit number one. Now, I, I just, I, I does, I had, are you familiar with this graph or not? <coughs> Who's familiar with this graph? I always tell all my students, you want to have this graph engraved in your brain. Like, you know, you know that one and one is two, know this graph. So very quickly, again, United States, the extreme case, 1917, as you see, actually the, the trend goes up to, to, to 209. Huh? So what you have is capture at the top. This is just earnings. This is not wealth. <coughs> then up at the high point, 47%. Then we have the big crisis, right, uh, in the, in the, the, the 20s. Then it falls down, adorable Keynesian <coughs> period, it goes down, it's still a big grab. That decline, though, allows you to establish the growth of a large middle class, modest middle class, the growth of a prosperous class. Those are the Keynesian decades, the adorable, really, in, ex in retrospective Keynesian uh, decades. With all the racisms and discriminations they had, they did produce an economy that wanted to expand. Why did it want to expand? Because it was based on consumption. So you wanted to pay your, wage, your workers reasonable wages. Today's economy still has consumption, but the organizing logic is not. The dominant sectors are not about consumption. It's this high finance, corporate, etc. So there are, yes, a lot of consumption sectors. But then look at that. That is what I was predicting, you know, way back in the late 80s. 1987, it goes up again as if nothing had happened. When you read the literature of that period, the Keynesian years, you have a sense, you know, so often they say, we found the formula to have a more democratic economy. We will never give it up. Before they knew it, it was back up. So now, partly that, that, that possibility is a mixture of policy and a mixture of the structure of an economy. It was mass manufacturing and mass consumption. So that we don't have that in our advanced countries anymore. I, I just don't want to move on this. This is another one. Look at this. This is wealth ratio of 1% wealth to median wealth after the crisis. Whoop! Sharpest increase. These are very disturbing trends. I don't know if you follow. Uh, I love these simple lines. To me, they tell stories. But Now, how much more time do I have? I should be ending. OK. So, so um, it, and again, here I come back to my analytic tactics. When I say urbanization, and I mention urbanization because so many politicians now say, and most people are living in cities and blah, blah. I can't stand that phrase anymore. And so I ask myself, when I say urbanization, this self-evident, 
What don't I see? One element I don't see, which is feeding into the growth of cities, is land grabs. So here, very quickly, I'm using the data from the land matrix. Anybody who's interested in the land grabs, the land matrix is a worldwide network, has the best data, uh, over overall data. So old history, new face is one way. I don't want to go into that debate, the imperial and all that. So from 206 to, 20 to 2010, 220 million hectares of land, only properties that are above 200 hectares are measured. So Europe, by the way, which is getting land grabbed as well. I don't know if people know that. It is. I have some very good little stories on that. Um, Europe doesn't show very much in, in, the, in the chart that I will show you, because in Europe, many of those, those properties are quite, are like 200 hectares, and then they buy five little, you know. So there is a, Europe is not sufficiently present. Now here, I look at the yellow, the yellow uh, lines. You can see Africa dominates, but other parts are rising. Europe very flat, actually bigger. I mean, just to give you a sense of Europe, two, two stories. One is France. So sons and daughters of former farmers uh, wanted to buy land again to become farmers. They said, that's a better job than my unemployment in Paris, so to speak. Uh, they couldn't buy it. It's all been bought up by corporates. The UK. Do you know that wonderful Swedish company that is very this and very that, HMM something? HM, H, H. There you go. Wonderful owner. He just bought a huge piece of land <laughs> in the north of the UK, of England proper, actually. I don't know what he's going to do, but, you know. <clears throat> and then in Cambridgeshire, around, around Cambridge University, you know, these amazing stretches of farmland, very rich farmers, etc. The, 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 what are they called? Is this is a kind of religion, Mormons. <laughs> the Mormons of Utah have been buying vast plots of land. Again, the, the sizes of this land is different from what you can do, say, in Africa or in Brazil. But you know, this, this story, and so I'm really, and that is why, <coughs> remember at my start of my talk, do you remember what I said? No. So, so I said that one, one image that I have in my expulsions book is that the actual operational space of our economy, society, whatever, you know, the, it's actually shrinking in terms of the actual borders. You have a lot of land that is dying. And this is then also producing some of these land grabs. But it also, when you then add the land grabs to it, if you take a given country, land that is dying, you know, due to pollution, due to whatever, <coughs> mining, land that is being, up by, being bought up by foreigners, these are beginnings of trajectories. I mean, on some very grand historical level, too general to be useful, this has been going on for millennia, clearly, any conquest, you know, et cetera. But I'm just looking at this current period. And I don't know where this goes, but when I put it together with my notion that a lot of what constituted our society, economy, you know, what belonged, is being expelled, is being shrunken in one way or another, this, massive number of unemployed, long-term unemployed people that simply are no longer counted even. We now have men in the United States, 33-year-old, 35-year-old, who have never held a job. And Berlin has a lot of very nice men and women who have never held a job. But I think that is, again, a different story. You know what I'm talking about, about artists and all of that. But, you know, <laughs> it's a different story than, than so, you know. But uh, those men in the United States, they, they are suffering. Anyhow, and other item here that often is overlooked most of it is not to grow food. Most of it is to grow industrial crops, biofuel crops, you know. That. And that means that they put an extreme amount of pesticides and fertilizers which kill the land. Because since it's not food, you know, you can sort of poison the whole thing. Now, I am always, I know that there are many anthropologists, you don't need this, but many of the audiences that I talk to, like economists and I don't know at all, uh, I always say, you know, making a plantation <laughs> is actually a real process of making. And it means first evicting the floras and the faunas. 
then evicting rural cultures, rural genealogies of meaning, knowledges, economies, manufact rural manufacturing district, eviction, 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 till you get a very elementary condition, land. And then you go at it in a way that doesn't respect what it needs and you kill it, right? Because these, these, the, 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 the practices that were there before it becomes plantation, they knew about crop rotation, they had knowledge about climate, etc. The other part of me, talking about immigration, where do those people go? They go to cities. They become part of slum dwellers. They who were carriers of knowledge that we're now often trying to recover about land, about climate, about vegetation, they are flattened into slum dwellers, like erasure of a lot. This, these are enormously complex processes. And so they go to cities, they become, they are not necessarily going because they want to, they're being evicted. So I really think that in this question of, of immigration as category, you know, I'm sure you know more than I know about all of this, but it captures only part of the story of people on the move. Huh? And we've got, to, we've got to find more language, more precise language. Anyhow, so, and, and then <coughs> just to situate all of this, my dead land, dead water, there's going to be more and more land grabbing because much land is being killed and temperature is one part of it. When land gets hot, it can still look green, uh, green on the surface, but it's dying. So a lot of the Midwest in the United States, which calls itself modestly the breadbasket of the world, not just of the US, uh, it still looks very green. I mean, they have super fertilizers, and I don't know if they also paint it, I really don't know, but <laughs> it's dying. Not all of it necessarily, but the temperature is rising, rising, rising. So, you know, it's the, the temperature of the earth, eh? not, not of the air. So we're going to see more of these expulsions that are the, of people, of, you know, that are the result. And these are some of the areas, I mean, the United States is severely implicated in this. Latin America somehow escapes that, but these are all where water is already limiting agricultural productivity. You know, if you add then the heating of the land, etc. And by the way, I love this graph, so I am, <laughs> nobody asked for this, but. So the dotted line is where we are at. If we implement it, all the policies that we right now have, policy, I mean policy, not scientific knowledge, policy, that is a little difference. So my, my big project now in the environment is that policy will get us nowhere. I mean, we need some policies, true. But we need, so I argue for this, I have a big project on cities and working with biologists and with, with um, material science people. Every surface in a city should be working. You know, this is sort of, because we are really losing ground. I mean, it's just extraordinary. I want to end with this notion uh, I want to sort of return at some basic element, you know. One way of putting it is, who are we the citizens? But I mean citizens in a very encompassing, I mean those who reside, a form of membership, whether you're an immigrant or doesn't matter. Because a lot of what I show brings consequences. And, and one name for those consequences is expulsions, being expelled from, expelled from your histories, from your cultures, from your space, from your home, from your city, et cetera, from your, from your livelihood. And I want to end with this map. Who has seen this map? This is in the public domain, by the way. Have you seen it? Right. But I'm always amazed at who has not seen it. So, which is always the majority. So this is 10,000 buildings. And, and many of them, when this was originally made, it's in the public domain, I repeat, huh? um, uh, some of them are under construction, like Utah was under construction, it's now made. Washington DC has a few others that they're adding. Basically 10,000 buildings, most of them private. They are full-time gathering information. You know, this 24 hour non-stop. So if you've been two hours in the United States, you're in this data set. Now, I want to point out two things because it is another instantiation for me of my category expulsions. The logic, there are two logics that organize this enormous apparatus. One of them is that it is gathering data about everybody in the territory of the United States. That makes it 
a very expensive operation. We, the citizens, of course, pay for this. Um, and one asks oneself, well, who really benefits? Well, the tech companies certainly benefit. The upgrading of everything, the construction companies, you know, etc. Now, th also, I want to point out that in its full materiality, this is invisible. You can be standing in front of one of those buildings. You wouldn't know what it means. Now, second, um, second aspect of the logic of this system. Um, the way it works is that we, in a first instance, first moment of the process, we're all suspect. That's how it works. A very peculiar and I would add wasteful logic. If we're all suspect, they need God about all of us. They need vast numbers of machines, vast numbers of buildings, vast numbers. There are over a million people with top secret clearance working in there. This is a very costly operation that we the citizens pay. Germany is under a mini state of security. The UK is under a mini state of security. France is under a mini state of security. This is happening, as you know, in some countries in Europe as well. Now, how does this work? They find the suspect, not in this data, this is unmanageable. This is 20, it doesn't, they find the suspect through their old prejudices. Muslim! <laughs> and then, after they found them, sort of the schleppy mode of the street, prejudice, this, that, then they move into this data set and they see all the possible connections that the suspect found through very traditional slash irrational ways, uh, then they make all the connections. So here I want to leave you with this final image, which is that my image is that, so they hit Manhattan, lower Manhattan, lots of coffee shops, etc. When I go to one of those, I live in lower Manhattan, to one of those coffee shops and I open up my computer and I try to pull down the networks. You know the Mac, it shows you automatically all the networks in there. And like 60 networks. So my image is, I have to confirm that this is, a, somebody told me that this is a possibility, is that all the data there gets completely scrambled. If they locate one person who has connections with Lower Manhattan or is in Lower Manhattan, then the whole of Lower Manhattan more or less is suspect. That is not workable. So anyhow, I love that image that the mass of people, urban space, can actually unsettle this extraordinary uh, apparatus. So, uh, oh no, I'm, I just, I, I see a note. I, I thought I had a, a blank slide, but I'm not. I so I wanted to, th this is too much. We can maybe in questions and answers show it. So that's, that's the story. I'm just going to shut up. I see that I already <laughs> talked far too long. Thank you very much. <laughs>